As Michael said at the outset, um, we, we were very happy to have the sponsors that we've recognized already. Uh, join us to support research into what differentiates those hospitals at the top of that chart um, from the rest. <clears throat> what are the common characteristics of, of the most efficient hospitals within that group? So the, uh, this is a, a, one of the Greening Healthcare Applied Research Projects, and you can read uh, the overview there, essentially, we went out to all the hospitals on those lists and said, uh, first, how much submetering have you got? So we can look in more granularity at how energy is being used in your facilities. And are you willing to share the data from that information so we can, we can get, if you like, a whole bunch of benchmarks. Uh, so we got lighting, uh, lighting energy and heating energy and humidification energy. Uh, so breaking down that total energy into uh, the systems that affect it the most. Uh, the hypothesis that we had was if we can figure out which systems are doing the best, then we can engage everybody, the uh, industry, the hospitals, the design teams in, 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 in achieving those good design, good standard practices uh, in every hospital going forward. So over the, the past several months, we published uh, the Humber River Hospital case study at the end of last year. So you'll find that on our website. It's a, a great story, not just of the performance data and the systems, but also the decision making. How did the hospital manage to pull that off? What is still one of the most exceptional energy performance levels in the world? Uh, we had the hospitals that took part and the industry players come together in a strategic workshop to look at findings and give us their recommendations. We'll share some of that thought with you. Um, we uh, are now today in that last bullet but one in the recorded webinar sharing what that information looks like uh, and uh, our report, the guidance document that will go to hospitals everywhere, it'll be public document, uh, will be uh, again produced within the next few weeks. We uh, posted on our website, it'll be on the websites I'm sure of uh, the project sponsors and free for everybody to use to take what's useful in there and immediately start applying it with hospitals that you have under development right now. So uh, the, the very simple goals of this work are one is to help all the hospitals that didn't achieve the energy levels uh, that they should be capable of at the outset to help them move up the chart and to help every new hospital in the pipeline get it right the first time. Have that high performance level enter the game at the top of the chart, then hopefully improve further still. So that's the overview of the research project. And again, our thanks to the organizations that made it possible. Uh, the timelines, as you can see, the whole thing uh, comes to a conclusion by the end of November. Uh, but this work has been going on back into 2021 as all this came, uh, came together. And again, I would commend to you what you'll find on our website, greeninghc.com, uh, the Humber River case study listening to Bob Collins, the CEO of Humber River Hospital, talk about, uh, again, their decision-making process, their values, their principles, their, their corporate objectives that made such exceptional performance possible and then allows us all to climb on the shoulders of what they did and, and be even better still on a go-forward basis. So that's the basis of the research. It began with what we've already shared, which is total energy use, broken down between heating and thermal, then broken down between components of energy use, which help you zero in more and more on where the, uh, the opportunities are. But uh, then moving on from there, the majority of these hospitals have interval metering. That means it's not just back in the day, a meter reading person would arrive at the building and read the meter and write down the numbers and move it down. These days, everything is electronic. It's all transmittable. And so the electricity use in your facilities is being tracked 24-7 throughout the year. The metering never rests. It never sleeps. And it's tracking these profiles of electricity use. So the, the first commendation to everybody on the, the call is pay attention to your electricity use profiles. So if we look at this comparison 
with acute care hospitals. And this is in watts per square foot that's derived. So you can lay one on top of the other. Uh, the big differences within here, uh, you can see the peaks, the red one, A2, has the highest peaks. Uh, and this is in February, so it's the middle of winter. There's no cooling plant running at this time. Those peaks are hitting up around three watts per square foot. And uh, our good friend A1, um, uh, Humber River, again, that, that one is, is acknowledged and declared, is looking at around 2.7 watts per square foot peak. Um, the bigger difference you'll see there is the valleys. Look at how deep the valleys are. Humber River drops to around two watts per square foot overnight. Uh, the others are significantly higher, which has everything to do with scheduling. So very simply, a big part of the Humber River hospital story is they're just really good at switching stuff off when they're not using it. And this scheduling, it sounds obvious, it's not happening. Like most hospitals with higher energy use are running too many systems 24 seven. So the shape of your profile by comparing your profile to top performing hospitals, and we'll show you the metrics in just a moment, uh, tells you both, did you get the peak right? Which means, did you design your lighting well? Did you design your fans well? Are your pumps about right? But the values are even more instructive. Are you operating the facility well? Are you doing a good job with scheduling? So there you are in February, the winter time, no cooling plant running. Here is the equivalent in the middle of summer, in August of 2021. And you see even more pronounced effects there. So all of the hospitals are responding to days that are hotter and days that are cooler and milder. Um, but you can see just how, how much better the performance of our blue one, A1, is uh, in responding to cooling. It, uh, it runs pretty steady through the year. And keep in mind that right through the summer, its cooling is generating all the heat it needs for reheat through its heat recovery chillers. And again, the great work that Humber River did operationally was really orchestrating that, that heating and cooling plant so that everything runs to the right level at the right time to maximize the overall plant efficiency. But the, if we go to continuing care, you get, get similar examples. And here we see some, um, the, the red ones, some remarkable spikes getting up close to three watts per square foot, which you recall in winter was about where the acute care hospitals were um, and other continuing care. Now we should, we should be clear, continuing care is a much more mixed group. We've got uh, mental health facilities here. Uh, we've got uh, restorative health uh, and, and, and we've got ambulatory care facilities all within the same group. So they can be quite different from each other. Uh, but nonetheless, the comparison of the profile Look at the peaks, look at the valleys. Uh, the peaks are a, an assessment of design and the valleys are an assessment of controls and operations. Likewise, in August, you see these peaks become even more uh, pronounced. And I can assure you that uh, uh, C8 is busy looking at those factors right now and working to, again, this is an area of, of clear opportunity and commands the focus and the attention of everybody to, to work away at it and bring those numbers down. Here are the, the numbers. If you have an acute care hospital, you're interested in these are the numbers we'd like you to take away as watts per square foot. So here is the range. So we publish this information and these charts will be in the report that comes out. We publish this information in terms of the daily max. So what's that peak load? and the daily min, which is what's that valley load, and then the ratio between the two. So uh, on weekdays, A1 is around 3.3 watts per square foot. It, it drops down to 2.4 at night. So that's around three quarters. So it drops its load by about one quarter. And just heads up for everybody that's interested, one of our key areas of research next year is to look really hard at that 2.4 watts per square foot, that valley number and look at the component parts of that and say, as well as they are doing with scheduling, are there still things running at night that can make that valley even deeper? But if you look across all of those right now, the best practice row there are the numbers I'd like you to write down. But again, you'll have them in a few weeks in the final report. Uh, those we would say are what you can measure your new hospital model against, and you can measure the interval data from your current existing hospital that you're looking to improve 
and those become decent targets based on good practice today, which is what greening healthcare is all about. So uh, still interesting why we only drop one quarter of the peak load down to the valley at night, uh, but we'll learn more about that. And maybe that 0.73 can drop down to 0.65 by the time we talk to you a year or two from now. So there's your summer numbers at the top, the winter numbers at the bottom. Same thing for continuing care facilities. And again, the, the, the best practice numbers we've listed there for both summer operation and winter operation. And when we uh, compare the, the highest of these among the acute cares to the lowest, um, the, this is over the whole year. Uh, and you can see when they're testing the generators, all those little, little uh, sticks that, that come down below. Uh, but that comparison is interesting. You see it's much more pronounced in the summer than in the winter. And again, with your all of the new hospitals or recently built hospitals on this call, this kind of data should be available to you. And you can overlay this on top of good practice standards and get a really good insight in terms of where should you be focusing. So interval electric metering uh, data we're uh, very bullish about. Um, the same applies to natural gas. You know, take a, a look at this with... Uh, uh, in, in this case, we, we only had, I think uh, we had five, uh, five hospitals that had interval gas data. Uh, we know our friends from Enbridge Gas are on the call. And if you're from utilities in other parts of North America and the world, interval gas metering is just as powerful as interval electric metering as a diagnostic tool enabling hospitals to identify where they're doing well, where they're doing less well, and then really manage carefully the progression towards higher efficiency, excuse me. So uh, interval gas metering in the middle of winter, you see it there, the higher using hospitals getting up around one cubic meter per thousand square feet. Uh, the two most efficient being uh, right in the middle around 0 0.3, 0 0.4 uh, cubic meters of gas per thousand square feet. Uh, again, very pronounced the difference the seasonal variations are as interesting as the daily and the weekly uh, variations. Uh, the uh, same applies during the middle of summer. Now, if you look on the vertical scale there, uh, these are much smaller numbers, but look at the dramatic difference between A1, the blue, uh, and the rest. And I, I would tell you from our experience that, that the lion's share of that difference is entirely to be found within simultaneous heating and cooling. So it's your, your boiler plant running to reheat the air that you've already spent money cooling down with your cooling plant. Simultaneous heating and cooling. It's unavoidable in hospitals for humidity control, uh, but if it's not controlled effectively through scheduling and temperature reset on supply air and all those good things, the numbers can become massive really, really quickly. And it's by far the biggest single opportunity. So uh, gas metering, wintertime, summertime, and once again, looking at the highest user versus the lowest user, you can see the shape. And keep in mind, again, this is all uh, in cubic meters per thousand square feet. So it's normalized for the size of the hospital. Uh, these are both acute care facilities. And for us, interval metering shows so visually like how, how different things are that uh, we hope it's even more motivational than the amount of money that some hospitals can make. The, the red hospital there is one of those with the potential for well over a million dollars a year of savings if it comes even close uh, to where A1 is today. So that, again, takes us through, um, again, the first step is just looking at monthly and annual data and breaking that down by components. Going to the next level of interval meter datering, his uh, data metering uh, just takes it up a whole notch in terms of being able to understand where the excess energy is going and do what you can about it. Let's go on to sub metering. So I, I touched on this earlier that um, the, the, the extent of metering we had uh, initially assumed, not believed, just assumed. Uh, was fairly extensive. The sub-metering would be part of these in terms of managing the performance nature of these P3 projects. 
In fact, that final column on the right-hand side there, the systems uh, metering, many, especially of the older hospitals have very limited metering and some we just weren't able to establish the level of metering they have. My assurance to everybody is to get to these high performance levels, uh, you, you will be applying more strategic metering to your facilities to allow you to zero down into where the six figure savings opportunities are to be found. So we're intrigued by the range of metering within the buildings. Uh, but not going to ask you to write all these down because uh, uh, you're going to get them in the report, uh, uh, which will be coming out and available on our, on our uh, website in the next few weeks. But you see here the range of uh, chiller energy use, kilowatt hours per square foot. And look at the two, A10 and A11. These are design numbers. So a couple of hospitals were kind enough to, to, to submit their modeled numbers uh, because the hospitals uh, in, in these cases weren't operational yet. Um, and you can see A10 is higher than any of the hospitals we've seen so far. Same with lighting, uh, A10, the modeling is higher than, than, than is seen before. Um, similar with fans, but not quite so extreme, uh, but you see high usage at 7.5 and uh, you see others that are as low as four and five kilowatt hours per square foot. Pumping energy exactly the same. It looks again that A10 has overestimated its pumping energy use, which almost certainly relates to its overestimated or overmodeled its uh, its chiller energy use. Uh, we look at metered data and design data for plug load, plug load, receptacle load, process load, plug load. <clears throat> In a couple of cases here, uh, they're all merged together. We we they weren't able to provide separate numbers, uh, but once again, you'll see A10. Uh, would seem to be significantly overestimating the internal heat gains there. Uh, and this again is modeling results. And A10 almost certainly then relates to uh, why the chiller energy is too high and the pumping energy is too high, because most of the people on this call know how that works. If you overestimate internal heat gains, you miss size and you, you incorrectly estimate everything going with that. So these submetered, sorry, these submetered uses here um, become exceptionally useful for doing empirical calibration of the modeling that you're doing for new hospitals. Again, so we exhort you to, when the report comes out, take all the modeling you have right now, use these metrics and compare them. Now, you may have a good reason why they should be higher, but at least the empirical data can point you in the right direction. Similarly with natural gas. Again, I'm not going to run through all of these, but space heating, which includes reheat. Uh, and again, we're looking for ways to be able to break that out because that year round reheat separately from heating the space, the, 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 the envelope and the air, uh, humidification energy, you see the range of those numbers. Domestic hot water, uh, in some cases, uh, substantially underestimated, in other cases, uh, just way beyond what we would expect to see, like A6, check your domestic hot water. Uh, and the process loads around sterilization, such a major range. Again, there may be good reasons for these things, but they point you in the right direction for the questions to ask. So again, the key finding coming out of this research report, uh, or in, which is a guidance document to go to hospitals and design teams uh, is exactly this. What are the metrics that you should be looking at for acute care hospital, uh, hospitals and continuing care hospitals to compare against what your modeling is saying right now and either calibrate the modeling or explain the difference because these are good practice metrics from real hospitals, from real data. So both on the thermal side and the electricity side. Just uh, uh, concluding this, uh, the summary, the overview, the, the, the report back to you on, uh, on, on, on this research work around the systems level metrics so grateful again to people who are just as busy as the rest of us and still take the time out to help with this so we had a large group taking place taking part on september the 29th at the uh, uh, at the strategic workshop which is where we bring the hospitals and the players and the data bring everything together and we just kick it around we present it and we get their feedback so again thanks to all of these people for uh, for taking the time and sharing your expertise and this is the kind of 
uh, feedback that the participants in that session pass. Recommissioning really matters. Uh, the cost benefit, and we, we want to touch on that in, uh, in, in next year's, in phase two of this work. Most of the things we've talked about being the differences don't cost very much, if anything. So this is not a capital cost issue. This is a, a, a thoughtful design and, and, and careful operational issue that the PSOS, the, the, the output specifications right at the start have to deal with this, that the contracting agencies in, in Ontario's case, Infrastructure Ontario, needs to be part of. And we've always welcomed their involvement with, uh, with this work in the past, that thermal energy savings is driving this bus. That's where the biggest problem is, and that's where people um, should be mostly focusing. Uh, from our standpoint, the energy consumption, the carbon energy consumption costs money, carbon's costing um, the world the way that we know it right now. Our focus is entirely on carbon with the utility cost savings being a bonus. Um, and there is a sequence, there is a logic to this stuff that we're gonna again further develop in further stages of this work like step-by-step, step, how do you work through this? And interesting technical advisor on how many system level metrics can we add to this mix, excuse me. Um, one of which will be Delta T, temperature differential across heating and cooling circuits. They're easy to measure, becomes a metric. And as you know, the lower they are, the higher the pumping energy use. And so that becomes a piece of the overall puzzle. So again, thanks to the people who took part in the workshop and uh, uh, again, all of these insights and inputs are finding their way into the final report. So I'm going to check with you again, Michael, but I'm feeling lucky today. Am I, am I going so fast I have everybody uh, bemused or are there any questions coming in? There are questions coming in. We're just answering them through the Q&A and chat, though. Sounds great. Sounds great. And, and again, we will, we will put them up on our website so that you can see what the, uh, the background conversation was going. So again, the highlight of these uh, sessions always is a panel discussion. And once again, we thank the panelists, not only for, um, for taking their time out today to share their experiences, their knowledge, their insights with us, but also having spent time with us leading up to this to get to the point that we, uh, we had what we, we hope is a useful and uh, coherent story. Uh, so we wanted to revisit West, uh, Women's College Hospital today. Um, so um, they, we recorded those back in the day as, as, uh, uh, as our top saving hospital. The new hospitals that started up had, done, had made the most progress in improving the energy efficiency after the day opened. So I'll remind you of some of that information from the case study, which I believe is still up on our website. And Emiya, with your experience at, uh, at Niagara Health, uh, both with the existing St. Catherine site that you're working with and with South Niagara that's uh, getting underway right now as the new development, um, really welcome your thoughts um, coming into the mix. And the, the question we posed to both groups, to Women's College and to uh, Niagara Health um, was, Given these new metrics, um, are they, can you see, how do they fit in with what you've already done? Because both hospitals have made some savings. I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, and can they be useful in directing you to where, uh, where your remaining opportunity lies? And the profiles of the two hospitals, again, we're not going to share details. Uh, we, we've already had those discussions with them, do point in particular directions. So we'll, we'll, uh, um, we'll, we'll kind of share that. So how can these new metrics be used? And we hope, uh, even though this is very early information and nobody's had time to use it and apply it and show how it works, uh, we're hoping that, that this conversation with our panelists here can help kind of move us in the right direction and prompt some thinking with everybody else in the audience about, okay, we've got this new information now, how do we apply it? Whether we have a new hospital under development or whether we have an existing hospital we're trying to improve. Let me give you a bit of context before we go there. So Women's College, this is from our original uh, case study. Uh, this is their savings. Do you remember we looked before at the blue dots below the red dots? The red dots are the weather normalized baseline. The blue dots are the actual use. And this was a great story. And we thank both Black and McDonald who run the facility and, uh, 
and Lauren and her team uh, for sharing this uh, and this case study. Again, you can find it online, but having lowered their, uh, their electricity use by 20%, in fact, both electricity and thermal energy use. And you can see where the improvements are. Um, the, 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 the chilled water consumption down mostly during, uh, during, during the summertime, uh, the electricity consumption being down year round, both base and cooling electricity. And uh, on the steam consumption, this is a central steam from the M-Wave steam plant. Uh, you can see significant reductions in the last two years in the summertime, that's base thermal, and during the wintertime, which is heating thermal. So there's a specific profile of the improvements that Women's College has made over this period, and we'll kind of ease into that. And the kind of things they've been doing that, that support that. Uh, this is their scheduling of the ORs. And again, we've covered this in detail on a uh, previous uh, webinar, uh, but the, uh, the continuous running um, operating room systems, and this is an ambulatory care, so it's scheduled, uh, it's, it's scheduled operations time. And you can see what happened after the introduced scheduling. That plays a very significant part of the heating thermal reduction, the base thermal reduction, and the electricity fan power reduction, and the chilled water reduction. All of those relate directly to these kind of things, but this is anything but the, uh, but the whole story. Similarly, uh, not yet as dramatic, but, but uh, what Amir has done, you can see in the middle of winter on the gas side, the, uh, the consumption is coming down. Uh, electricity yeah, took a hit during COVID because systems had to uh, had to run longer, uh, but St. Catharines, again, very conscious, very aware, moving in the right direction with their own operations team. And this really becomes the, uh, if like the context of, of the conversation we'd love to have with you guys today. So um, if I could, uh, let, let me just kind of step back to, uh, to our panelists. Lauren, would like to start with you. Can you give us a bit of a of an overview of the philosophy uh, behind the changes you've made so far? In other words, a quick kind of synopsis, if you like, of what you shared with us in detail uh, around uh, the story so far. And Erica and Varund, uh, love to get your perspectives then from the operational side. So Lauren's asking you to do these things. What does it actually look like when you're making changes in the field? So Lauren, over to you. Sorry, I couldn't find the, the unmute button. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, being on the on the hospital side, I think part of my role is sort of engaging, obviously, with the, the technical folks from Black and McDonald and then bringing in key stakeholders from the hospital side, um, depending on, on what type of project. So in speaking of the case study that you featured, which was... Um, the air exchange setbacks in the operating rooms where we went from 20 plus air exchanges running 24 seven down to six air exchanges. It was really sort of a, a real working relationship between Black McDonald and the hospital side. We had to make sure that we engaged folks from the operating rooms and ensuring that they were comfortable to implement these changes. Um, and part of that was ensuring that we did trial and error. So we didn't just flick the switch. We did a lot of trials until they were comfortable, um, ensuring that we met CSA standards, those types of things. Yeah. Erica, okay. is there anything further from the Black McDonald side? Sure, thanks, Lauren. Um, just to your question about the philosophy behind it, Ian, I think yes. one thing in the beginning, um, I've worked on this project since I started with Black McDonald's, actually the first project I worked on. So Lauren and I have been in it together since the beginning. Uh, and it's been a great collaborative relationship. But one thing that I think was important for us to realize as a company is when you start reporting and provide that level of transparency on building performance, it's, you know, it's a report card for our own operators and for the level of services that we offer in the facility. Uh, we take a lot of pride in the work that we do. So there was a lot of motivation from our team and from the operations side to improve on that. So when you first start seeing those numbers roll in, because you know it was handed off to you know, from construction to operations and to our team as well, uh, there was a lot of push to get that down, um, not just due to the structure of the P3 agreement, which does have pain share gain share, but 
to prove that we could provide the level of services in the building to drive down consumption and reduce the overall impacts of the hospital. Uh, and we couldn't have done that without that relationship with the hospital team as well and their willingness to let us do all those trials and to let us test uh, and continue with the transparency and data uh, since day one. That's helpful. And uh, I want to come back in a moment to some of the metrics coming out of this research for both your hospitals, but Amir, similarly, can, can you give us a bit of an overview of the last uh, several years that uh, you've been working to uh, to deal with efficiency at the St. Catherine site, and, and maybe a couple of thoughts about how how did that experience find its way into uh, the New South Niagara site in, in Niagara Falls that uh, uh, this just, I guess, soon will be getting into construction, which is exciting. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Ian. Um... So the we have had, uh, you know, as um, you know, the women's college experience, as Lauren uh, mentioned, you know, we kind of have the similar experiences. Um, as everybody knows that, you know, you're uh, you have to work with your partners when you're a P3, right? So th yeah. that does bring in a level of um, a level of challenge, if you may, you know, where. Um, you have to work within the uh, confines of a PA and, and that contractual relationship. So that does make things a little more complicated than because I run four other sites. So, you know, it's a little easier for us to make those changes compared to perhaps, you know, in a, but um, I think uh, our journey has been similar where we are, we have, we are working on the occupancy scheduling as our main uh, project right now we've done a few retro uh, retrofit projects and lighting and stuff but um, uh, uh, we have been working with our partner and they are, are receptive it did take us it was a bit of a challenge for us because we were the first among the first yeah. hospitals of the assembly line so the learnings as to how to operate within um, the P3 environment, you know, uh, we kind of trailblazed as to what should be the rules and that kind of, and we were then learning from other organizations as well as other hospitals as, as they came online. Um, I think uh, the other uh, limiting factor uh, or the challenging factor in the PA that we have is the um, is the five-year reset right on the baseline, and that, and then how it works with the pain share gain share because that's what the PA mechanism envisions the savings to come from. So that does make it challenging as to how. So we are working with our partners to kind of ensure that you know their investment is protected, and how do we protect it? Working perhaps outside the five-year reset as well. So it does take us longer to get the changes in place, but we are in the right direction. Now, as far as the learnings, are, I, we have asked them to bring us another, you know, slate of projects where we are gonna pick and choose from as to see, and my direction has been, let's work on some carbon reduction projects uh, because the price of carbon, if it continues the way it is, is going to become very challenging. And, you know, usually everybody focuses on electricity projects, but we have to change our, you know, thinking a little bit to focus on now the gas side, um, which which are a little more complicated projects than perhaps electricity projects or some of the low-hanging fruit that you can. Now, as far as our uh, journey towards the South Niagara, we're one of the few lucky hospitals who've been able to get a second project and, the peop and then transfer the learnings from the first into the second. Um, second project but then again trying to translate because right now we're in the design conceptual and design phase well in the uh, not not even like you know detail but you know kind of conceptual phase the PA is being developed and that kind of stuff so uh, trying to translate this all into a project agreement has been a very interesting journey how do you make sure that the wording is correct and accurately displays the reality of operations it becomes very challenging because you know when 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 pedal comes to the metal the project goes or in an argument it comes you it says you should it doesn't say you must right so like how do you ensure that that kind of language is uh, in place where it's uh, 
where it's 100% clear and no ambiguity, right? It's, it's challenging. So we are working on it, but we are lucky to have had the experiences to transfer the learnings from one into the other. And we're hoping of on, in coming up with a, a much better uh, design. And thank you for the work that's coming through your group um, and, and uh, which is helping like today's, like to look at who is a better performance and aim towards that rather than replicate what we have right now. The easiest, our default position always is, what we have is working good, let's just replicate it. Well, no, there is somebody doing something better, let's find out. So you have been very, your group has kindly brought all that together and we're very appreciative of that. Thank you for that, uh, uh, Amir. And again, as you know, nothing's possible unless the hospitals are willing to go out of their way to help. Erica and Verona, I want to kind of, so kind of full disclosure to everybody, this is new information. It's over the last few weeks that we've been really sharing this with uh, the Black and McDonald team and with Amir and with, uh, with Lauren. So a lot of what I'm going to be asking for is around imagining and speculation and what you've seen in the metrics. Uh, let's start with women's college so far that are interesting and if and how they can help you redirect your focus to the next level. The common factor of St. Catharines and Women's College is as improved as they are, uh, they still have room, uh, room to go. They're not at the top of the benchmark chart yet and they're going in the right direction. But looking at that, my, my recollection is that on the component breakdown, um, on the component breakdown of energy use, it's the base thermal. It's that year-round thermal, which sounds a lot like uh, uh, like it's reheat in the air handling systems. Has, has that opened uh, any, any thoughts or directions around where you focus your next efforts of projects to make improvements? Absolutely. So yesterday, uh, we have a, there's a utilities committee that meets on a quarterly basis for Women's College Hospital, but we also have an energy working group, which is a smaller subset of that team. Um, includes more of the operations crew to meet on a monthly basis to really focus on some of the measures that we're implementing. So we actually just had a meeting yesterday, which focused on the recent findings that we just went through today uh, with a heavy focus on thermal energy. Um, and Amir alluded to that, that there was a big focus on electricity savings because it's a big chunk of our costs and it's easier to save on the electricity side. And so you kind of get more bang for your buck in terms of the level of effort that you can put in on the operational side. I'm sure you guys have discussed it in the past, but all the improvements and savings have been driven from operational improvements, which is yep. great. Um, okay. I see somebody raised a question about funding. We do try to make sure that we're maximizing the savings that we can from the systems that the hospital has there without putting capital into the hospital. So pretty proud of the savings that have been achieved to date, but recognize that in the future, um, capital projects might have to be at play. But we went through, um, and Lauren and I were discussing this before everybody hopped on the call, we included a couple of our operators in the discussion yesterday and just, you know, those are our best resource to be honest, yeah, especially yeah. within Black McDonald's, just go to those teams and ask them, what are they seeing in the facility? What do they think the ideas are? They notice things that are left on, very simple things that we can start implementing next week uh, and some other measures that we will have to evaluate and cost out over the next couple of months. But we're excited uh, to take the next steps and dive into the thermal energy load. That's great. And Amia, coming back to uh, St. Catharines, it's, it's almost the mirror image of Women's College. Women's College is that summertime year round base thermal load uh, with St. Catharines. In fact, it's reasonably efficient at the base thermal end. It's, it's the heating thermal. Um, so as, as you think about that, can you, it, it, does it point to measures that will be, as you say, on the list of projects that you'll review with your service provider? Um, the, the, um, heating thermal usually means outside air. It means ventilation systems running too long, maybe not being properly balanced. Does does it help you kind of screen some of the projects you guys are considering and say, man, we're going to focus on that one? You're on mute, Amir. Yeah, sorry about that. I said some very intelligent stuff in the last 20 seconds. It happens to um, me all the time. Then I forget what it was. And then uh, <laughs> so uh, first of all, you know, I, I'm just going to say uh, that uh, project uh, uh, at Women's College for the ORs, I definitely I'm going to reach out and, you know, uh, our, uh, to kind of, you know, learn from your experience, Lauren and uh, Erica and uh, Vern. 
uh, to kind of learn if, um, you know, how we can implement it, not if we can implement it, because we are going through a phased, um, you know, uh, occupancy scheduling projects as, as and, and progressive. Right now, we're working on some of the support service projects. Anyways, going beyond those, you know, what we already talked about, um, we have instructed our or work are working with our JCI team. I'm not sure if any one of our JCI partners are on this team uh, on this meeting, but we are asking uh, them to bring us a list of projects with some business cases. Now, the challenge, of course, I'm going to go back to the PA is that even to develop a project, you have to spend money, right? So, and we understand that, and, but the partners, um, it's a, you know, for-profit uh, or business working in a non-profit environment. So it, they have to, you know, justify every dollar they spend if they're gonna, you know, if they're gonna build a project to a certain position. But, um, uh, or even to do a business case, you know, to measure what the savings are going to be it becomes a little bit challenging. So we've been having a lot of conversations, but, you know, we I have shown a lot of flexibility and said, listen, bring me something. I am willing to even, you know, fund some of this. Uh, the utility companies are, are there, you know, through yeah. there um, now, like Electra pays for some of this and Enbridge pays for some of this. Let's go and harvest some of the incentives out there. But I am also willing to pony up cash to, you know, develop some business cases, but bring them to us and then we'll discuss how. So I don't have a list of the next level of projects, but we are definitely working on bringing them forward or developing them to a point where we can start picking and choosing from a list of which ones to, uh, depending on how much money we have at the time and what the business cases are, right? Let's talk about business case a bit, Lauren. The, um... As I say, it's, it's not intended to be definitive, but that chart that we showed a little while ago that showed the dollar savings and uh, uh, women, both Women's College and, and St. Catherine's site, um, both of those show big numbers. That Do those kind of metrics help with the business case uh, or, 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 or do you require more kind of granular analysis that, uh, uh, that you look at individual projects? So the dollar driver, the utility cost driver, uh, how, how does that work? Are those numbers useful in, uh, I, I guess, again, making the business case, prompting action at the hospital level? They, I, I, they certainly are useful. Um, in fact, this is what we brought to our working group, as Erica mentioned yesterday. And so we started looking at, okay, our, we know we've got a lot of savings on the table or potential savings for thermal what and we're always going to start with what are cost neutral potentials right because again you know otherwise you're looking to either the hospital to invest in the capital or you've got to go to your p3 partners to to kick up the money right so yeah. we'll always start with a cost neutral solutions and being uh, an ambulatory facility where we know that we have a lot of opportunity for setbacks especially after hours weekends um and so one of the projects or one of the things we talked about yesterday was um in in office out in the office areas and basically our whole um phase two tower is primarily offices so you know we know that um we can have the opportunity to go down to zero air exchanges per csa standards and we could drop the temperature down to 19 degrees um and so we're going to start with with that right off the bat and in fact we're implementing the trial starting today so that we can calculate over the next couple of weeks what our potentials are in savings and again that's just from making that that programming change on the BAS um another thing that actually was brought forward to us by the shift operator is simply closing the doors so we are going to do a simple push communication out corporately across the hospital about the importance of closing the doors, because as we know, when the doors are open, the VABs are constantly running because you're never achieving the set point of the space. And so this is happening all over the hospital. We have door closers, but staff know how to push the hold open on the doors. And so, again, I think it's just the communication piece that people don't fully understand the importance of why we're asking them to close the door. So those are just some small things that we think will have some big changes or big um, savings potentials for us from a cost neutral perspective. But I think to what Amir was saying, when it comes to 
capital outlay, it becomes more challenging when you are in a P3. Um, I look to um, an LED retrofit as an example. So the hospital we had uh, a couple of years ago, we had some additional funds that we could spend. And so we decided to um, retrofit the parking garage to LEDs, but we issued a variation, but this becomes tricky. And this is not something that we would wanna do throughout the facility because the hospital does not own the O&M or the life cycle for these lights. So by doing this variation, it changes the whole risk profile of the contract. And then also when you have a pain share gain share that's built into your PA, it becomes quite complicated as well because the hospitals outlaid the cash on the, um, for the garage, which now means that we're entitled to the full gain share for that area. So you then have to calculate it. It just becomes mm -hmm. a, bit of a, a bit of a mess. And so how do we, we know that, you know, there's gonna reach a point where we've tackled all the low hanging fruit and it's now time to outlay the projects. And so similar to what Amira said, we're open to fronting some of the cash, but again, it wouldn't be the full project. And we obviously, it would need to be incentivized for both parties. Um, and where there's another layer of complexity for us is, is that Black and McDonald doesn't own the life cycle. There's another women's college partnership that owns the life cycle. So, right. you know, we can work very closely with Black and Mac on optimization, but at the end of the day, we need the shareholders to pick up the money to pay for the new upgrade or whatever it is that we want to do. And I think one of the projects on the table that makes sense for us that we've had discussions about is potentially moving to a new system that is um, like a CO2 sensor that you install in areas because we know that we've moved to a hybrid working model and we've got a lot of spaces that are unoccupied. But, you know, the BAS can only do certain programming, right? You've got your, your daytime programming and then your after hours programming. But it doesn't know, obviously, in the day who's there, who's not there. So this CO2 type of sensor, I think, would make sense for sort of our facility and, and how we've shifted since the pandemic. That's helpful. Amir, I wanted to pick up on uh, your second child. So the first child was in Catherine's and... I don't know about you. In my case, my first child was the easiest, but uh, but uh, I, I wish you better luck with South Niagara. But South Niagara comes along, as you say, you've got that that visceral working experience. You've lived with it. You've uh, gone. Uh, what found its way through? And I'm almost wondering uh, if if we were just a bit late coming up with some of these metrics. You know, how do you feel about uh, if you're able to comment on this? Uh, the, the energy target for the new place, but to what extent would these metrics have been useful to your project development team uh, in coming up with, uh, in being able to incorporate the lessons learned from St. Catharines into South Niagara? Same mute uh, again, Emir. Um, no, that's, a, that's again a very, a very interesting question. And, you know, I'm going to try to be as diplomatic as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, while working with uh, with partners to develop this together, um, uh, what 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 helped us through this work was that at least it gave us a target. And of course, the target is A one, right? A one is our target. Yeah. We want to achieve A one. Beat Humba. Uh, but yes, we want to be number one, right? Like yeah. we have the opportunity to build a brand new hospital many a moons after, many a years after, you know, the best performing hospital is built. Guys, can we do better, right? And, you know, I, I am a little bit disappointed as to where the design sits right now. I mean, is it going to become better and, you know, whatever. But there were also challenges based on that site, right? Like, as you know, Ian, that we couldn't get put in the... Um, uh, put in a ground heat system uh, there just because we're sitting on a on a on a on a you know reservoir of gas, so we, you really can't drill down. Uh, we can actually blow everything up if we go <laughs> go and drill a hole. Yep. Who's going to plug that hole? And if there's a match stick, boom, 
you know, the whole thing blows up. But anyways, there are cycle related challenges, but that beyond that, you know, also, I think there's always a pushback from the builder side as well, because it does put a little bit of responsibility on them to perform at a higher level. Yeah. And, you know, really this, the P3 model as it exists right now, in my mind, this is just my thinking, does not incentivize, incentivize the service provider to make any changes. Really for them, we're paying the utility bill. They could hold the building as it exists for the next 30 years and really not care about this because the 3%, you know, the pain share gain share does not really incentivize anybody to make, do any, anything. It's better for them to just sit tight and do nothing. It's us who are pushing them to, you know, do better. And because really it's my money that's on the table that I want to save. They're getting, the, they're making their money anyways. So I don't want to be critical about uh, around there, but you know, it's definitely an interest thing as well, right? Self-interest. So we, I think we did get a lot of pushback in the design. Uh, as it sits right now, I think we haven't been able to achieve the, uh, do better than A1, which, you know, I'm not sure still, well, we did talk about, I think we know why as the design sits right now, but uh, your work and this work was extremely important. Because as I said before, it's easier to replicate what you got, but you know, once you have a model that you know is much better and trying to replicate that, even if I can't get, I can at least get to 80% of the savings, I'm still, I'm still way ahead than where I am right now. Sounds, sounds good. The, uh, uh, th there were a couple of other areas I'd love to have gotten into you, but I'm also conscious of uh, of the time and respectful of uh, of everybody. So I, th I think I, I'm going to call this one to a halt right now. I, I just want to really, you know, Lauren, I mean, Erica, Rund, uh, again, thanks for taking the time out. And again, remind everybody, it's not just to, to be part of this conversation this afternoon. And hopefully uh, for me, I've just taken a whole bunch of notes, uh, trigger some, some more uh, important thinking around this direction because this journey continues. Uh, but also the preparation time you put in with us. And we look forward to the ongoing conversations. And we certainly look forward to recognizing both of you as the most improved uh, of the P3 hospitals in, in next year's report. So uh, once again, a, a great thanks to uh, to the panel for their contributions. I'll remind everybody that uh, this webinar is recorded and uh, you'll be able to kind of relive all these comments and remind yourself of, of the wisdom and the insights that have been shared as uh, as we move forward. So thank you all and uh, let's step on with, uh, uh, with the rest of the program. That's interesting. Right, okay. So lessons being learned, that's really what we're here for. And again, I, I can't afford to cut that time uh, short because this really is what this research is all about. It's new knowledge, new uh, understanding, and we've characterized these in 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 five different areas. Uh, the first that one of our sponsors, the independent electrical system operator, wanted to know about is what are the measures, what are the design, what are the operational things that you actually do uh, to make the difference, and we've summarized. The seven here that we think are the most important, uh, and one you know, I always thank you for this, Amir. This was a this is an Amirism, uh, designing for operations. So the design is designed to make it easy to operate the the, the building, the systems uh, efficiently. So designing for scheduling, designing for set point resets, designing for all the things that are necessary, design zoning, all those kind of areas. Um, so having operations in mind for every design decision that gets made. Uh, big effect of Humber River was low static pressure, um, air handling system designs and effective zoning, having the right number of boxes in the right place that you can turn things up and down at appropriate times, but oversizing in particular the air handling units to keep static pressures down has a dramatic effect on fan power, which is and now the, the biggest electricity user in hospital overtook lighting some time ago. Uh, comprehensive heat recovery. We've had this conversation before. It's like if you put a, a thermodynamic um, membrane around the whole hospital and no heat is allowed to escape through that membrane without giving up its 
there's treasures first. So uh, exhaust air, every exhaust air fan having the heat extracted and put back into the building, the heat recovery chillers pulling out all the process loads, no air cool condensers running in winter, not allowed, but Bowden, uh, wastewater leaving the building that it has to give up its heat before, uh, before it makes it to the sewer to the extent that we're still using boilers and for the foreseeable future, we will be fully recovering all the heat from the flue gas. It's like condensing heat recovery and, and putting what's left of that into the heat recovery chiller. Heat recovery being the biggest single step after efficiency, heat recovery is the next biggest step towards net zero. Uh, low temperature, hot water loops throughout the facility, not just parts of it. Sometimes we see hospitals only have partial uh, designed for low temperature because the modeling said there wasn't enough heat. Well, guess what? There is enough heat. So make sure the whole hospital is equipped for low temperature hot water. Uh, the integrated plan, like orchestrating how uh, the boilers and the heat recovery chillers, how all of that plant works together to give the best efficiency under low load, mid load, and full load conditions. Always preheating domestic hot water from the heat recovery chiller, using that recovered heat to preheat your domestic hot water as a significant load. And especially Humber River, those lighting metrics we saw, good lighting controls, it's dramatic just how low the lighting electricity can be. It's the lowest of the group and it still has largely fluorescent lighting. So these are the key measures that we'll be flagging. Energy modeling and targets is a big deal. So um, the, the idea, uh, what, again, set Humber River part of the original was uh, my good friend, Laurie Pella, uh, the hospital technical manager on the project that found an empirical target. He said, how much energy should our build, building need? And then uh, the, the project codes that bid on the project calibrated their modeling to match that low level. So you start with a target, then you use the model to figure out how do you get there from here? So this calibration of modeling and, and across all of these areas at the, uh, at the, the annual energy use is the, is the big number, the interval meter, what should the shape of that profile be? What should the system level energy use be? And specifying as much of that as possible to ensure you get the outcome uh, that you're looking for. Uh, using empirical data for internal heat gains and user loads, we find them to vary wildly between the assumptions people are using. Uh, the communications part, engaging hospital departments uh, early in the process so that they agree to scheduling up front. So you're not trying to impose it upon them after the fact, which is always uh, more difficult. And this idea of the modeling profiles becoming part of the commissioning process so that you can actually see that you've got the required profiles of performance for every individual system which we're calling advanced recommissioning. It's a big step uh, around that. Um, Submetering standards that I think both St. Catharines and not, not sure about Women's College, but uh, the strategic metering, which has become apparent is really valuable through this project uh, that you will need to add. So those, those conversations I know will continue. And the direct metering is always preferred over inferred, subtracted, in other words, if I'm using this much energy here, if I'm using that much there, then the difference must be what this one is doing. Uh, those tend to be reliable and the source of considerable disputes. Um, and once again, these sub-metering profiles becoming part of the commissioning process, so you can validate every one of the profiles uh, that matters. Uh, again, there was real interest, and we're going to develop this further in phase two, how do we take these lessons learned around metering, around profiles, around that step-by-step -step process and apply it to existing hospitals? Because we've got hundreds of those for every one of these new hospitals that's kind of coming into being here. So taking this whole process and developing that to what is the logical way to achieve these kinds, the best of the low carbon outcomes in existing hospital facilities. So important work on a go forward basis. We've got a uh, communication plan was the fifth part. So uh, who, do we wanna, who do we wanna reach? We wanna reach the hospital redevelopment teams, the, their design teams, uh, the project co's government uh, in the Ministry of Health with the government contracting agencies. Um, all of these data can help them do 
a more evidence-based and effective job of delivering consistent high performance outcomes from the outset, getting it right the first time. This webinar recording, I say, will be available uh, in, with, within a week or so. Uh, you can go revisit the highlights and, and add to the notes that you've taken. Uh, the user guide, which is the outcome of the high performance research work that will be available in November. And we will be tracking this on a go forward basis. We'll be back at the same time, excuse me, next year with, uh, with another year's results and another year's improvements and another year's additional hospitals in the mix. And I say our intent is that some of those will be uh, from other jurisdictions because we really want to spread that net. Uh, just to bring to your attention, on December the 1st, we're getting back together in person, uh, the first for three years now, uh, the first annual forum at the uh, Western Harbor Castle. We hope that you'll all be there. Uh, if, uh, if, if you get nothing out of it, but to hear Dr. Ronald Cohn um, uh, speaking to Project Horizon, the, the work that they're doing at Sick Kids Hospital, which we see as just world-class groundbreaking stuff. That alone is worth the price of admission, but we'll have rich content in a number of, of important areas, both at the strategic level and at the tactical kind of fingers dirty level. We'll be updating everybody on our international best practices. People have seen this chart before, but we're looking for the top 20 most efficient hospitals in the world. We can tell you that uh, number two on this list is Humber River. Uh, number one is a hospital in England with a national health service. And we expect to get new information on all of those before we arrive. But right now we're mining data around the world and you can see um, nobody has first rights on best practices. The locations of the most efficient hospitals are everywhere. And our low carbon future for hospitals is found in that little box at the top of that big chart. Uh, they're all doing something special. And between them, they have that foundation that we can build from high efficiency to net zero. The pathway goes through the most efficient existing hospitals. So let's just share. Uh, next step, please come to the forum. We uh, look forward to seeing you. Uh, we will be completing this new hospital standards document and getting it out there because hospitals in the pipeline need to be using these metrics right now. We were a bit late for some. Uh, we're right on time for those that are at this stage at the moment. I'll say again, Everybody on this call, please consider whether you your jurisdiction is one that can add to this data set of highly efficient buildings that we can build on and further expand the knowledge. Uh, we'll be talking to all of you about phase two, the next level, uh, looking at design intensities, the watts per square foot, the thousands of BTUs per square foot, those kind of design metrics that you can use directly when you're designing these hospitals. Uh, making the business case, we're doing a lot more work on the cost of some of these things. Uh, we think they don't cost very much and they have a powerful business case. We need to document that. So it hopefully helps everybody to make those uh, decisions to move forward. Uh, this performance-based project commissioning will be developing that, especially around the DBF projects that are coming down, down the line right now. So design, build, finance without the gain share, pain share. How can you use commissioning to make sure you get the outcomes you're looking for? And again, we'll always be looking for case studies and we'll be expand, extending these results to existing hospitals. Final word is, you know, Michael, the program manager, you know, Anand Deep, who does the, he's a technical genius behind all the numbers that I stand up there and tell everybody about. Uh, but it is thank you, it is contact us, but join us. You know, if you're interested in this work, please get hold of uh, Michael and say, you know, we're, we're in California or we're in Mexico or we're in, uh, in Newfoundland or we're in England, wherever we are. And how, how would this work? And we kind of bring this into the mix to further develop the story next, in the next, uh, uh, for, for next year's episode for, for the ongoing research here. So as always, once again, thanks to our excellent panel for, for a great conversation. Uh, thanks to everybody for taking the time to join us and, uh, Look forward to seeing you at the forum. And again, look for this event this time next year, where we'll give you the latest uh, and, and, and even more in-depth information than we've had before. So thanks everybody and have a great rest of the day.